here in just a second while all our participants are, are let into the meeting here. It looks like they're coming in. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's meeting of the Capitola City Council. Uh, my apologies for our, our tardiness in getting started this evening. Uh, before we start with our roll call and our Pledge of Allegiance, I'm going to turn it over to our interim city clerk, Chloe, for uh, some details about how to participate in tonight's meeting. Hello, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? So unfortunately, because I think this is technology, this is the way it works, I'm not sure that we have our, our, our city clerk piped in at this point. So for information about how to participate in the meeting, you can find that on our published agenda. In addition, you can find out how to participate um, by going to the city's website. And there you can find information about joining the meeting by Zoom, uh, participating uh, through watching it on, um, on cable or phoning in. The host would like you to unmute your microphone. You okay, can press you. star six. All right, so let's get started then um, with a you are unmuted. and it sounds like because we're having some technical difficulties in, in Hello, uh, Mayor, I'm audience. here. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Hi, I'm so sorry. I just was let in, and I'd be happy to do a roll call vote whenever you'd like. Or we're roll ready. call. Thank just you. roll call. <laughs> just roll call, yes. Thank you so much. Council Member Bertrand. Here. Council Member Bator. Here. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. Wonderful. And Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, let's go ahead and move forward with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, All right. I pledge allegiance to, to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, unto God, and the soul with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, can we move forward with the report on closed session? Yes, we had closed session on the item on the closed session agenda and uh, no action was taken. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additional materials? Yes. We had two emails in support of a beach closure regarding item 8A. Uh, one email in favor of item 8D and 94 notes against that item. And it, for item 8F, there was one supporting document. Great, thank you. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Not that there are changes. All right. So we're going to move on now to public comment. Uh, this is for uh, this is an opportunity for the public to address the council on any items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you have joined us this evening to comment on any items that are on tonight's agenda, you will speak to those items when we get to them. Um, but for now, it's public comment for any item not on the agenda. So I'm going to go to the attendees and take a look, and I'm also going to turn it over to uh, our moderator, uh, Larry. I, I think, can you hear me now? Yeah, I think can. I'm on. Okay, great. Um, I do not see any hands up, and I do not see any items um, via email for public comment. All right, great. I do not either. So with that, uh, we will close public comment and move forward with city council and staff comments. And we'll start with staff. Does staff have any comments this evening? I don't think we do. I think we're running late, and we need to keep moving. All right. Uh, council, council members, uh, and I see a hand up. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. I just want to um, ask staff that as we move into the election period, this is my third time requesting a process on our onboarding. As we know, we make this, and I've asked for it a couple times, and, um, and looking at that and bringing that back. And then also, I just want to touch on the Black Lives Matters 
movement. Yet again, we have seen another life taken. And I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm sure Mayor Peterson will talk about this about an upcoming community um, forum that she will be leading. Also, I just want to thank um, Joy Flynn, who has been an outstanding leader in our community in supporting the cause and inspiring others to practice anti-racism. I also want to just give um, acknowledge uh, a speaker at the Black Lives Matters um, movement, or excuse me, March the, uh, last month, Bakari Brodnack, who was an incredible speaker who is from Capitola and who is really um, leading the, car the charge on um, anti-racism here in Capitola. Thank you. That's all I have. Great. Thank you. I see uh, Councilmember Bertrand has his hand up also. I do. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to thank the public safety personnel in Santa Cruz and supporting agencies around the state of California, and I think the nation also, uh, the firefighters in particular, and the police department and the various sheriff's department, uh, members of the sheriff's department. Um, they provide a lot of assistance to the uh, residents that have, uh, in many cases, lost their homes and are in quite dire straits. So um, with that, i um, also like Chief McManus to, um, well, he may comment on this later, but I, I believe we've had uh, some of our personnel from our police department also give aid. So thank you for that participation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Breton. Um, no additional comments from any other council members? Okay, I've just got a couple and I'll try to be brief because I know we're, we're running behind. Um, I want to first uh, echo what Councilmember Bertrand said in thanking the uh, fire and law enforcement personnel that are uh, out there for very long shifts, 12 to 24 hour shifts at a time, uh, to, to put out the fires, to protect the homes of those who've been evacuated. I want to send my heart and my thoughts out to those who have been evacuated. These are very difficult times. Uh, and thank you so much, as mentioned, to um, all, all of those addressing this issue, but uh, also to our own Capitola PD that is providing uh, additional service as well as our, our, um, our fire. Um, I'd also uh, like to remind for, for anyone who's uh, listening from out of the area uh, that the county has asked that visitors, uh, tourists, and summer renters return to their home counties right now so that we can allow space for evacuees in our hotels and vacation rentals. Uh, this is incredibly important. There are so many people out of their homes right now, and we need to keep as many of our vacation rentals and hotel rooms uh, as possible open for those who otherwise do not have a home at this time. Um, third, as uh, Vice Mayor Brooks uh, mentioned, on September Wednesday, September 2nd, from 6 to 7.30, will be the first of four uh, monthly conversations about racial justice and equity in Capitola. Um, these uh, conversations were uh, suggested by Joy Flynn, as, as Vice, Member, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks suggested, uh, and several of our community members have come together to, to put this together. Um, so if you're interested in participating, the link um, is, has been shared on Nextdoor. It's on uh, my, my Facebook page. Uh, if you're interested in participating, please feel free to email me. My email is on the city webpage, and I can provide you with the link to register. Uh, fourth, um, eight, August 31st, is Overdose Awareness Day. And on August 31st, there will be um, an editorial and op-ed in the paper that I have signed on to, as, along with um, Mayor Justin Cummings in Santa Cruz and others, um, to really draw focus to the stigma of substance abuse that prevents many from seeking uh, treatment. And so that's something that we need to address as a community. And then finally, uh, I received word a couple weeks ago of the passing of a Capitola resident, uh, Emil Edgren. Uh, Mill Edgren was a photojournalist documenting the, documenting the events of World War II and was a member of the U.S. Army Pictorial Service for four and a half years. He was a contracted photojournalist for international news photos, the Associated Press, Press, and Unlimited Press International. Emil lived to be 100 years old and is survived by his wife, Lucy, his sons, Robert and David, and his granddaughters, Kristen and Renee. So I'd like to acknowledge his the passing of a 100-year-old Capitola resident uh, who is well known and, and loved by many um, and convened tonight's meeting in his honor and to send uh, my thoughts uh, and love to his family. So with that, uh, we will move along. 
to our consent calendar. Uh, these are items that will be enacted by one motion in the form listed on the agenda, and there will be no separate discussion on the items prior to the council vote unless a member of the city council requests specific items to be discussed for separate review. Is there any member of the council that would like to pull an item for separate review? Seeing none, do we have any member of the public that would like to pull an item from consent calendar for separate review? I don't see any hands and we don't have any emails requesting that. Great. I'll move the consent calendar. I'll second. All right, motion by council member Story, second by council member Bosworth. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Bosworth. Aye. Council member Story. Aye. Vice mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Passed unanimously, thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to the um, business of the evening, starting with item 8A, receive an update on the city's pandemic response. Hi, Mayor Council. For a second here, I am pulling up the slideshow. All right, is that showing up on people's screens? Great. So this is, I think, maybe the eighth update, ninth update we've done now on the COVID situation in Santa Cruz County. Um, our total case numbers are up to 1,700. You can see the epidemiological curve there on the screen, which shows that we did see a, a spike in cases in probably mid to late July. Um, the trend does seem to be that the case numbers are coming back down, which is great news. Um, in addition, we're at 45 cases in Capitola at this time. This is, if you haven't looked at it before, this is the indicators uh, web sub page on the website, which shows the different indicators that the state looks as they consider whether a county is going on or off a monitoring list. The two indicators that we hit uh, previously, which put us on the monitoring list with the total number of cases in 14 days, the cumulative number, and we remain over that indicator. Um, and then in addition, it's with the number, and you can see it here, the number of, the percentage of cases that come back positive, and there's a threshold of 8%. So when more than 8% of your cases are coming back positive, that's a sign that it's, it's, it's more prevalent in the community. Um, we have since gone back under that threshold, and we'll talk a little bit more about the monitoring list. And then these are the other indicators as well that are tracked uh, when, when evaluating where we're, how we're doing. Statewide, uh, you can see that there was that also that case statewide, um, the spike in, in mid to late July. Uh, case numbers statewide do seem to be coming back down. Um, in addition, the, the deaths uh, have been slightly trending lower. In general, it seems that the death rate seems to trail the cases by about a month, uh, in my experience, when you look at these things over time. In general, Santa Cruz County remains uh, one of the better counties in terms of the number of cases per capita. You can see there's only a few counties in the state of California with lower cases per capita than uh, Santa Cruz County. This chart also shows that we're just about 20 days behind in terms of the per capita rate, the Santa Clara, um, Santa Clara race. As I mentioned before, the 42 cases in Capitola that we were put on to the statewide monitoring list on July 27th. Um, and then on the 14th, we came off the monitoring list. And the requirement from the state is that you have to remain off the monitoring list for 14 days before the restrictions will lift. That will be coming up tomorrow. Uh, the state has not published guidelines yet about what it exactly means to come off the list. So we are all um, very actively checking the state's website and communicating with them to try to get guidance about what's gonna start happening as of this weekend. So the city issued an emergency war order on August 6th that makes it an infraction rather than a misdemeanor for a violation of the countywide mask order. It gives our police department another enforcement tool uh, that can be used uh, to help ensure and gain compliance with the mask rules. 
The other jurisdictions in the county have done something very similar, created the administrative citations. This essentially creates an option to issue a $100 ticket rather than a full misdemeanor for a violation of the mask order. And on your agenda this evening is a resolution to ratify uh, that emergency order should the council wish to do so. As has been widely reported in the press that earlier this month, the County Board of Supervisors and the City of Santa Cruz have voted to close their beaches on Labor Day weekend. The closures would take effect for all three days over the weekend. The beach would, the ocean would remain open during the closure. And the orders that the City of Santa Cruz and the County have passed do open the sand from 4 to 8 p.m. on both Saturday uh, and Sunday late afternoons. We have prepared the exact same closure for the Capitola City Council to consider. And if the council so chooses, uh, the Director of Emergency Services, that would be me, I will issue our sixth emergency order uh, related to this. And there's a resolution to ratify that order in your packet tonight. Um, at this point, most city facilities are open. We do require social distancing, do have protocols to ensure that the public and the staff members are protected. The closed facilities at this point are the community center, the historic museum, and then we have closed parking as the council is aware for outdoor dining. So with that, I'm available for questions. All right, thank you. Uh, looks like Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up and then I saw Council Member Story. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. I just have two questions. Um, this is for our city manager. Do we anticipate seeing any other uh, closures at this point? So I think if you're asking about closures for the beach, at this point there's been no regional discussions about any closures beyond Labor Day weekend. If we're talking about the businesses uh, and economics, I really just don't know what will happen with both the virus and the orders from the state or the local health officer. Okay, great. And then my second question is in regards to the fines associated with the mask, is there any way to restrict those dollars for other uses in the city, like our community grants program or a dedicated children's fund or this CIA? Um, is that something we are able to do? So I think the technical answer is, is, is no, not really. The administrative citations would come in and they are, they are, they're, general fund. Um, restricted funds are usually for are, are, are associated with voter approved tax measures and the voters essentially restrict them. The council certainly has the ability, you have the power of the budget and you can appropriate the funds however you see fit. Great, and, uh, okay, and, and Samantha, if you have a different take on that, that I'm misreading that or answered incorrectly, please chime in. No, that, that's correct. I mean, it's I mean, the money all go into the general fund and the council directs expenditures from the general fund. So it, it, it just goes into one pot of money. But as to the technical answer, absolutely, we can't very well use it to create a separate fund, but we can make whatever spend expenditures the council directs from the general fund. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Council member Story? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my question goes to um, the proposed order on page 120 of the packet. Um, and I'm just wondering what the difference really is between an administrative citation and an infraction, since they seem to carry the exact same uh, monetary penalty. Um, so that, that was my question. I'm hoping the city attorney can chime in. I, I think the question, as I understand it, are you asking between what it was before this order and what it is after? I, no, as, as I read the order, it says that um, that the um, it's based on the for the mask, uh, lack of a mask for the following penalties, depending on the determination of the issuing officer. Um, which would be A, an administrative citation, which then says carries a fine in the following amounts, um, $100, $200, $500. Then it says B, an infraction carrying a fine in the amounts 
then it goes on to say $100, $200, $500. So it seems to be an option by the issuing officer, but I'm just, I I don't see a distinction between those two in terms of what the um, penalties are. And so why, why it would matter. I am going to lean on our city attorney on this. This is the okay. Sorry, I'm unmuting myself. Um, okay, okay. So I'm, I'm looking up your meeting code now, but it, it, for practical purposes, there may not be much difference. If the chief is on the call, perhaps he could step in and help here too. But I'm looking up in your meeting code. It could be, and I am no criminal law attorney, it could be that one is a um, criminal enforcement mechanism and one is a civil enforcement mechanism. Um, but I will, if you want to continue, I will look that up in your meeting code right now. <clears throat> and Mayor Peterson, uh, uh, Council, good evening, if I may. The, um, and I think we all understand this, the, um, the biggest difference between the, the previous citations of the health violations is it was a criminal citation. Neither an administrative site or an infraction are a criminal citation. So that, that's a clear difference that is probably beneficial to our officers and the public and feel uncomfortable going forward with enforcement. Uh, but our city attorney is correct. For our purposes, there's virtually no difference between an administrative site and an infraction. And in fact, the officers will be issuing infractions for violations. Some departments and cities have administrative citation programs in place to process uh, an administrative site in a circumstance similar to this, which would introduce a level of appeal within the city. The only administrative citation program we currently have in process are the citations related to the animal violations. And so for the purposes of this violation, this mini code violation, we will be issuing infractions for those people who are violating the, the code. Hope that answers your question. Thank you, Chief. Does that answer your question, Council Member Story? Well, I guess that what I'm hearing is that um, that the issuing officer will only be issuing infractions. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why it has that dual language. It seems to be uh, a moot point, uh, but I don't think it jeopardizes the order. But thanks for that explanation. Great. Council Member Bertrand, you have your hand up. Is that for this item or for the previous item? I'll see you the previous, I'll take it down. All right, Um, I just have a question about the beach closures. Um, It looks like they're indicating it'll be closed 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. except on Saturday and Sunday where it'll be open from four to eight. Does that mean it closes again at eight? And and what is the the reasoning behind not just closing it down altogether for the three days? So you're correct is that it does close again at eight o'clock at night on Saturday and Sunday nights. the reasoning behind it, uh, because if this went ultimately to the county Santa Cruz first, who were the first ones to approve it, and my understanding was that there was some desire uh, by the Board of Supervisors to have a degree of access for the, for the community, that this was really intended to dissuade people to travel here from far away, um, but they wanted to be able to allow the community to still get onto the sand at some point on the weekend. So. It was a bit of a compromise, is my understanding. Okay. Okay. Um, and and, and uh, are we pre- we're prepared for enforcement? We are prepared for enforcement. The chief and I have had extensive conversations about it. I think we detailed some of those things in the staff report. We are prepared to get um, some digital message boards up beforehand to let people know about the closures coming and then when it is closed, that it is closed. Um, They're not cheap to rent, but it seems like it's worth two one-week rentals to put on Park Avenue and Bay Avenue to help get the message out there. In addition, we're prepared to utilize um, extra help because our experience is that we need to have staff present on the beach, otherwise um, the closure doesn't work. And then lastly, I would note the difference between this closure and what we had previously is the beach isn't open in the morning, which was really one of the huge challenges with enforcing it was we had to clear the beach, which is um, a big task to get everybody off the beach once they've already been on all morning. 
so in this case, we'll have um, staff officers or, or first alarm or someone there right from the beginning to make sure no one gets on the beach to begin with. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, any additional questions from council? Doesn't look like it. Uh, so with that, we will bring this item to public comment. Now we'll turn it over to Larry, our moderator, uh, to let us know if there's any public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, I do not see any hands raised this, at this time, and we have no uh, emails on this item. Okay. Uh, with that, we will close public comment. And I will bring it back to council for uh, discussion and a vote. I shall move the um, recommended actions for item 8A. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? Oops, let me go back to the panelists. Any further discussion from anyone on the panel? I see uh, council member Bosworth has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, if it suits you, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with the uh, concept of the beach being open from 4 to 8, um, making it feel like that's going to prevent people from coming and utilizing the beach. Uh, I would like to make a friendly amendment that uh, that window be closed to 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So Vice Mayor Brooks, I think uh, we're, we're looking to see if you're accepting that friendly amendment. Council Member Bosworth, you didn't take from six to eight, is that correct? Closing the beach, the beach would only be open for local people from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, and can you tell me a little bit about why this is, um, I, I, you know, I'm I, I looking at the numbers that the city manager put up, and uh, it feels like we're trending in the right direction. And I think we can all look at the July numbers and see that we lost a little control there. Um, I, I realize that it's awkward to close the beach, but I, I feel like the four o'clock window would still allow people to come, and 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 I, I don't believe it's going to prevent the over the hill access as we think. Uh, I think that. that Respecting the, the citizens of Capitola, which I'm mostly concerned about, uh, they want some access to the beach, but they don't want uh, an infusion of people from over the hill. I believe if we allow them uh, that window from 6 to 8 p.m., uh, we would be doing something that uh, goes along with the fundamental beliefs I believe the citizens of Capitola are looking forward to, especially on this weekend when we're so close to uh, continuing the trend of reducing our numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Botarf. I'll go ahead and accept your friendly amendment. And I the second was, was that Council I'll Member? accept it. Madam Mayor, I'll accept the amendment. Oh, it's Bertrand. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and a second as amended. Uh, any additional comments from Council? Seeing none, uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Carries unanimously. Uh, we're going to move on to item 8B discussion of the lighting of the village palm trees. I'll turn it over to staff. And Council Member Botor, if you still have your hand up, if you could go ahead and take it down just so that when we come back to comment, I'll know who's uh, I was, I was trying. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Public Works Director Jesperg here, trying to get my PowerPoint running. And there you go. <clears throat> Item behind it before us tonight is. Uh, Kind of a continued conversation of the village tree lights that are in the village right now. Some quick background. Um, this will be the fourth time we've uh, discussed this item at the city council meeting. Um, it all started back in 2018 when uh, we hung the holiday lights provided by the BIA at that time 
which were a rope light, a bright white LED light, a significant amount of uh, community input was received and we started having hearings that February um, of 2019 uh, to decide whether to keep them, what to do. In 2019, which is the most recent hearing we've had before the council, the council directed at that time an ad hoc committee, uh, palm tree lighting committee that had been put together to develop a plan to transition existing rope lights on palm trees to low voltage LED lights. Um, that plan was due in March and it was actually submitted in March by the committee. But at that time it was right when we uh, went into the COVID-19 pandemic and we delayed consideration of that plan at that time. Um, we were new to how, how the council meetings were gonna run and decided to continue it. Obviously, um, the pandemic has continued and so we have, are now having this hearing uh, through Zoom. Anyway, getting back to the plan, the committee ad hoc committee plan had um, included hiring a firm to place low, cost, um, low LED uh, warm lights at a cost of $14,000 plus some additional maintenance costs over the years um, on the palm trees. As part of the proposal, the committee had secured $11,000 in donations toward the project and requested assistance from the city of $6,000. Unfortunately, uh, since March and with the COVID, uh, those commitments from, that the committee had gotten have now been reduced to $3,000. And the committee effectively has withdrawn their proposal uh, to move forward. So this is the slide we've seen before. Uh, the lights, uh, rope lights you can see are the bright light. And this was a, a, a trial we, the uh, Christmas light installer had installed on one of the palm trees. So you can see the difference between the two lights. The proposal was to go to these <clears throat> warm twinkling lights um, on all the trees. <coughs> Excuse me. So without um, a budget at this point and the constraints on both the city budget, the BIA budget and other resources, you know, the lighting plan as proposed is, not, is no longer practical. Um, that really kind of doesn't give us a lot of options. Um, the two most practical options for the council to consider at this time are to keep the existing lights in place. Uh, Public Works does have uh, a store of the white light rope lights up at the courtyard from when they were originally purchased and we were, could replace those strands that are not operating. Um, the only other option that seems feasible at this point would be to remove all the lights at this time. Uh, that is my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, are there any questions? I uh, think you, Steve. Are there any questions, Council? I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. Seeing no questions, we will bring it to uh, public comment on this item and I'll send it over to our moderator. Looks like I, we have it hand up. You, oh, I, yes, I see a hand. Okay, sorry. I will, uh, while we talk. Okay, Karen? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, well, here we are again. Um, I think really in a nutshell, what I have to say is that um, things have, are in a very unusual state in the village. Uh, a lot of businesses are struggling. Um, some of the people who were on the committee and working, going to work with the people who were gonna put up the new lights aren't even in business any longer. And, um, uh, the hoopla over the lights does seem to have died down other than we're getting some comments about why can't the city, um, you know, make the repairs to the lights. But um, I think it's become less uh, of a uh, inflammatory um, issue in the village. But the bottom line is if you take the lights down, the village will be dark. There's a lot of dark storefronts makes it very challenging for businesses who may have a big empty dark space next to their business and may have only one street light somewhere on their block. So I would really um, hope that 
the city wouldn't um, wouldn't choose to take the lights down at this point. Um, I don't know whether all the council members know, but we do have um, uh, the city. The BIA has taken over the contract to clean the sidewalks, which we felt was the most important thing for our visitors and our residents who walk in the village all the time is to have the sidewalks clean. I know this is something that you know a long time ago we had the city had hoped the BIA would take over. We could never had the finances to do it, but now we're going to pour all of our village enhancement money into keeping the sidewalks clean. Um, so that's the main reason why we have no budget to put any lights up. So if you take the lights down, the village will be dark for Christmas. So we're hoping that you won't be a Grinch and you'll let us have our lights for Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have a, another hand up, Larry. Yes. Uh, Rodney, you're ready to talk? Yes, this is Rodney with Capsula Candy Company. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, awesome. So I think we can all agree that the lights make our village safer. All the restaurant employees that leave later have all agreed, have all complimented. I understand people's personal opinions um, of the lights have gotten in the way, and I think we need to put that all aside for now. It's all about what's best for our entire village and not our personal opinions. The, the lights have created safety. They've enhanced our quaint little village with a little nighttime sparkle. Um, there's nothing against going with the yellow lights at this point. We've all agreed that if everybody will agree on the yellow lights, we're fine with it. But at this point, we have no budget for it. So to take away the lights at this point is ridiculous. It's unreasonable and unfair to us merchants. And um, I hope that everybody will put that personal opinion aside and think about the village in whole for now. And hopefully in the future, we can afford to replace them and try out the yellow lights that um, the people that have been uh, against the white lights will enjoy. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Larry, I'll turn it back over to you. I don't see anyone else's hands up, but I don't know if we have anyone on the phone or any emails. I, I do not see any more hands up and I do not see any emails. Okay. All right, with that, we will uh, close public comment for this item, bring it back to council. I see that council member Bottorf and then council member Bertrand have their hands up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, uh, I, this this um, issue has been with us for going on, uh, I'm gonna say two and a half years. And uh, what bothers me the most about it was is that uh, there seemed to be progress on this that um, stalled uh, due to lack of financing to replace the, uh, the, the new lights. What was clear in the beginning was that when, uh, when the city gave the BIA the option to, to provide lights, it was always lights that were recommended or tasteful. And when the change was made and the new lights were installed, it was a surprise to everybody. And that's what started this process. And what, what ended up coming out of that is that the lights were gonna come down, uh, and but there was gonna be a committee and they were gonna come up with a program and that was gonna be resolved. And that wasn't resolved when it was supposed to be in October, it was pushed because of the holidays to say, let's just decide this in March. And then we all know that in March, COVID came and everything changed. But what happens is it becomes like any other program uh, in the village that, uh, you know, it was not followed through on. And what's happened now is that the lights have come into disarray. They have become the responsibility of the city, which was not the intent. This was to be taken over to be a program by the BIA, because what we did when we passed COT tax was we made an allocation to fund the BIA with $30,000 annually at their discretion with only a minor consideration that they reinvest some of the money into village enhancement. And even though we know that the TOT numbers are down, uh, they're probably still going to be coming in at approximately 15%. So this is a fund that although one year 
or maybe a year and a half, they may show a slightly different revenue. This is an ongoing budget revenue that the BIA has for village enhancement. And I believe that uh, there was a lot of procrastination about getting the lights done. And I believe that the way we get new lights put up that meet with the, uh, the that appeal to the residents, the village merchants, uh, and everybody in the city is to take down the existing lights because they're not the ones that, that, that people want there. Uh, put our heads together, get a program to go. Uh, the revenue will continue to come in and if the BIA will be motivated to get the new lights up ASAP because if we allow these lights to linger, they become a, a burden and responsibility for the city. It's already being proposed that the city's gonna come and hang the lights and make the repairs. And I think this program needs to be separate. That was the intent of giving that funding to the BIA. Uh, it was never the intent for the BIA to clean sidewalks. That, that is our responsibility. We took that off the table because of our, we took about $2.7 million off the table because of COVID. Uh, I think the VA should have been focused on getting the light hung because that was the priority. They opted to, to use the, the money for sidewalks, which I don't understand. I believe the city has been very generous with the BIA because of COVID. We released 49 parking places at a revenue of approximately $2,000 per spot for six months, which is of over $100,000 worth of lost revenue to help them open business. We waived all fees for encroachment and for permits. I just think the BIA needs to follow through on the lights and make it a priority. And by taking the lights down, that will make them actually make it a priority and get it done. So with that, I'm gonna make a motion to uh, do as we said back in October of, of 2019, and that is to remove the lights until a new program is created. That's my motion. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay, hearing that motion dies for lack of a second. We'll continue conversation. I see Council Member Bertrand has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, thank you for the uh, merchants stepping forward to clean the sidewalks. I think that shows pride in the area where they're doing business and will reflect well on the um, visitors to come here and see clean sidewalks. I think that's very critical for a merchant area. Um, I'd like this issue to uh, cease right now, so I'd like to make a motion that we accept uh, option one. I move option one. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion continues. Uh, was that the end of your comments, Council Member Bertrand? I'm going to lower. I'm sorry? Yep. Okay. Um, any additional comments from council members? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Botwer. No. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Uh, motion carries four to one. All right, we're gonna move on to item 8C, BIA amended budget. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah. Jim, that, may I interject? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Mayor, before you begin this item, um, uh, as I did before, I recuse myself since I'm subject to this assessment. Um, and therefore I have a conflict. So I'm going to uh, step out of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. We'll let you know when we're, we're ready to have you come back. All right. Let me okay. share my screen with everyone real quick. Okay, as we mentioned, this is the Capitola Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area Assessments for fiscal year 2021. Uh, by way of background, as you're all aware, in June of 2005, the BIA, BIA was formed. It's a uh, business-based self-imposed assessment district and with 
in which the assessments are paid by the businesses within the boundaries of the district for um, improvements and activities that support those businesses. And the assessment amounts are determined by business classification and number of full-time equivalent employees. Businesses may make in lieu payments in lieu payments in the form of gift certificates for use of the BIA. However, in this year, um, only hotels, motels, and inns are um, have the ability to issue the in lieu of payment. And so, a public hearing is required under California state law and our municipal code, and um, the BIA submits an annual plan and a budget for council approval for consideration and approval which was actually done on June 25th of this year. We conducted a public hearing and the annual assessments were approved at 25% less than the previous year due to the impact of COVID-19. The BIA is now requesting to utilize a portion of their existing fund balance that they've built up over the last four or five years and reduce assessments to 50% of the prior year amount. Should we know that there's no fiscal impact if this is approved, all services provided by the city are reimbursed by the BIA. And just as a reminder, uh, the BIA budget, as previously mentioned, does include uh, the restricted TOT. They get 50% of the um, T restricted TOT that goes to local business groups. And for fiscal year 2021, um, as of right now, our budget is about 14,500 of restricted TOT revenue going to the BIA. Uh, I think they used a little bit of that for establishment of the outside dining, and as Karen mentioned earlier, um, the rest at this point is programmed into uh, the sidewalk cleaning. So this is uh, what the assessments looked at, like by business category and number of employees at 75% of what they were the prior year. If um, approved and we reduce them to 50%, it basically is two thirds of those numbers up there and will change to the amounts listed on the screen. So staff's recommendation is to conduct a public hearing this evening and adopt a proposed resolution letting the revised fiscal year 2021 BIA uh, assessments and accepting the revised budget. With that, I am available for questions. And I believe, as you all know, Karen is on the line, and I believe there's a few other members of the BIA that are also available for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, council members, do we have any questions? I don't see any hands up. So with that, we will go to public comment. And I'll turn it over to Larry. It looks like we have at least one hand up. Yes, uh, I've got Karen. Um, she, she can speak. Um, hi again. Um, I think our treasurer, uh, Devin, is also here available to answer any questions. Um, it's pretty straightforward, um, just a little further reduction. Uh, clearly, we don't know what's coming next. We don't know. There's just so much uncertainty that we felt that the better option is to um, have the least additional impact on our members uh, this year, um, if possible. And, and the budget looks like it can handle that. And then uh, we assume that next year we'll go back to the full assessment. But um, I'm here for any questions, and I think Devin is here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Devin, uh, you can talk if you, if you want. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Hi, I just wanted to make sure this is Devin. Um, I own Capitola Reef, and I'm a board member and treasurer of the BIA. Um, I, just a couple things I wanted to say real quick. Um, in regards to the, the lowering of, of the assessment, um, it, it, it really is not gonna have any fiscal impact on, on, on our budget because uh, when COVID happened, we, you know, it took away almost an entire quarter of marketing expense that we normally would have used um, to market the village towards the oncoming summer. And also, um, so anyway, so it left us with more of a rollover amount than we've had in previous years. So um, actually, I, I think we're gonna be able to spend more money on village enhancement um, and more money in other areas than we even have in the past, even though we're having that, um, that, that lowering of dues. So I'm, I'm just asking for <clears throat> the city council to 
to look at that and, and understand uh, why we want to go in that direction. And if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Devin. All right, uh, Larry. Do we? I don't see any other hands up. Do we have any emails or anyone on the phone? I do not see anybody, and I do not see any emails on this item. Okay. All right. With that, we will close public comment on this item and bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. I know. Uh, recommended action for item 8C. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Brooks. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Council Member Bertrand. Uh, panelists, someone have their hand up? Oh, Jacques, was that it? You just, was your hand up just a second? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can I have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. No. Councilmember Story. No. Oh, pardon Councilmember me. Story. He's recused. I apologize. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Uh, motion carries three to one. And if we could get uh, Councilmember Story back with us, welcome back. All right, we're going to move along to item 8D, an amendment to the inclusionary housing ordinance, and I'll turn it over to staff. Okay, good evening, Mayor Peterson and Council. Just a quick technology check. Can you see my presentation on the screen and hear my voice? Yeah, yep. okay, thank you. Um, this evening we'll be discussing discussing the city's inclusionary housing ordinance and policy questions related to updating the ordinance. So I'm first going to give you an overview of what affordable housing is, then we'll go into exactly what our inclusionary housing ordinance includes, and then we'll discuss six policy items that we would like direction from the council on this evening. Affordable housing means housing that is deed restricted and residents must qualify to purchase or rent based on income levels. Under an IHO, an inclusionary housing ordinance is referred to as an IHO, uh, the affordable housing cost is typically based on the household's ability to make monthly payments necessary to obtain housing. For sale housing is considered affordable when a household pays no more than 35% of its gross monthly income for housing including utilities. Area median income is another term you'll hear me say frequently when we're talking about our IHO update. Area median income is the average income for a defined geographical area. Santa Cruz County area median income, also known as AMI, per household size increased this year. This slide shows the current AMI per household size in Santa Cruz. Um, the HCD lists out um, households up to eight persons. For simplicity in my slides, I'm just going up to four. so They're not too busy. But what you're seeing on the slide is the Santa Cruz County AMI, so area medium income, the average income. On the previous slide, I showed the AMI for Santa Cruz County. This term is frequently used when talking about affordable housing. There are different levels of income related to the area median income. Extremely low, very low, low, and moderate income levels are based on percentages of AMI. These categories of income are set by the state and utilized to set rental rates and listing prices for affordable housing units. The categories are also utilized in identifying our regional housing needs assessment, RENA numbers that are issued to us through AMBAG. Now I'd like to explain the demand for affordable housing in Capitola. This table is from the city's housing element. The housing element is, requi is a required chapter of our general plan, which must be updated on a regular basis. The next housing element update will occur in 2023. This table is from the most recent uh, 2015 to 2022 update. HUD released this data every five years, and this slide shows data from 2011. 
the income categories are listed on the far left column and the number of households within each income category is in the center column. It is a good indicator of the demand of affordable housing in Catatola. In 2011, 58% of households were in income categories below moderate income levels. In 2019, these numbers were updated. So this is what's in our current general plan. Um, these are the more, this data represents the 2012 to 2016 data that is available. As you can see, the demand for affordable housing is still high with 43% of households below moderate income but the demand has decreased from the 2011 data. So what is an inclusionary housing ordinance? Um, an inclusionary housing ordinance is a local policy that either, requi that either requires or encourages housing developers to include dedicated affordable housing as a component of any residential, of residential development. An IHO, your inclusionary housing ordinance, is one of the strongest tools available to cities for implementing affordable housing policies and creating new affordable units. Within the cities of Capitol, where um, our IHO is located in chapter 18.02, um, it was originally adopted in 2004. The city's IHO was last updated in 2013 and now is a good time for the ordinance to be updated again as it's been seven years since we've done a thorough update of our IHO. Capitola's inclusionary housing ordinance applies to all development projects with either an addition of 50% or more of existing floor area, one or more new residential units, and, or a condominium conversion. In the table, you can see the requirements for the different thresholds. Structural additions of 50% or more are required to pay an in lieu fee of $2.50 per square foot. New single family homes and developments between one and six new residential units are required to pay an in lieu fee of $10 a square foot. Developments with seven or more units are required to deed restrict one out of every seven units or 15% of the units. Um, as a deed restricted affordable unit. The remainder, if there's a remainder such as if there were eight units, so one last unit would have to pay an in lieu fee at $10 per square foot. Lastly, new res rental units are required to pay an in lieu fee of $6 a square foot. The city has 402 affordable housing units. There are 12 inclusionary units that were required by the IHO. Also, we have 166 affordable apartments in which over 100 are located at the Bay Avenue Senior Apartments across from Knob Hill. There are six units owned by Habitat for Humanity and not governed under the city. Also, 218 affordable mobile homes. Of the 12 inclusionary units, eight are located within the Capitola Beach Villas, two in Heritage Lane, one in Pearson Court, and the newest unit is located in Terracor behind Osh. Now that I've given you an overview of affordable housing and the city's inclusionary housing ordinance and the city's inventory of affordable units, I'm going to dive into policy questions which we have prepared for your discussion tonight. I plan to present the six policy questions um, and once I've gone through each of the policy questions, I'll bring up this slide again. At that time, we'll move forward with questions from the council prior to opening the public hearing. And then I'll, after the public hearing, when the council is giving direction, I'll pull up this slide once more so that you have a summary in front of you and we'll get direction on each of the policy questions individually. Now I'll jump into the first policy item. Um, so the first policy item, staff is asking city council, should the city maintain the existing required percentages of affordable units at 15%? In general, inclusionary housing ordinances require a specific percentage of units in a new housing development to be affordable to a specific income level. You may recall this table from a previous slide. This table shows the thresholds and requirements of the IHO. When the development comes into the city with seven or more residential units, the IHO requires 15% of the new units to be deed restricted as affordable units. 
This table summarizes the on-site affordable housing production requirements from, the, from other local jurisdictions. I just want to make it clear that this is not it's for the on-site requirements. It's not including all of their requirements for in lieu fees and otherwise. Um, the city of Watsonville, um, as you can see, Capitola, Scotts Valley, and the county of Santa Cruz all have the 15% requirement. The city of Watsonville requires 15% for 7 to 50 units, then increases the requirement to 20% for developments with more than 50 units. The City of Santa Cruz requires developments with five or more units to provide 20% of the new units as affordable units. Staff is asking Council, should the City maintain the existing required percentage of affordable units at 15%? And our recommendation this evening is to maintain the 15% inclusionary requirement. Um, now we'll go into policy number two. Should development of rental units be exempt from the IHO? Here again is the table which summarizes the city of Capitola's IHO. For this policy item, we are asking, should development of rental units be exempt from the IHO? The city of Capitola currently requires rental housing development to pay an in-lieu fee of $6 per square foot. The application of affordable housing requirements and in lieu fees for new rental housing development differ by jurisdiction, as shown in this table. Scott Valley does not require, does not have a requirement. The County of Santa Cruz charges an in lieu fee of $2 a square foot, and the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville require that 20% of new rental units be rented at affordable levels. Rental housing is generally one of the more affordable types of housing. Unfortunately, in our region, new rental units are already, are, are not being produced fast enough to keep up with the regional demand, in part because the market rents often do not produce enough return on investment to make development of new rental units appealing to most developers. Based on these factors, it may make sense to encourage more rental units by reducing the in lieu fee on most rental housing projects. This evening, staff is asking if development of rental units should be exempt from the IHO. If the City Council desires to continue requiring affordable housing production or the payment of in lieu fees in conjunction with new residential housing development, the IHO would need to be readopted into the municipal code, into the zoning code, rather than Title 18 um, to comply with AB 1505 the 2017 law that authorizes inclusionary requirements to be imposed on new rental housing development projects. The zoning code would update would also likely trigger a local coastal plan amendment before taking effect in portions of the city within the coastal zone. Um, this option is shown as option one of maintaining the in-lieu fee for rental units and then we would also update our zoning code. Option two is to remove the in-lieu fees for rental units. If this direction is taken, an update to the zoning code is not necessary. But within policy item number two, uh, staff is recommending that we remove the in lieu fees for rental units to keep costs lower for producing rental units. Um, for policy item number three, the question is, what should the city require of developers of large additions to existing homes and smaller developments that contain uh, two to six units? Again, I have the table up on the slide. The city of Capitola currently requires additions of existing single-family residents that increase their existing floor area by more than 50% and developments with two to six new units to pay an affordable housing in lieu fee. The in lieu fee is less for additions at $2.50 a square foot and for, um, compared to $10 a square foot for an entire new unit. The application of in lieu fees to developments with two to six units is the standard in the County of Santa Cruz but the application of in lieu fees for new single family development with only one unit or in addition to a single family home differ by jurisdictions as shown in this table. 
Um, the column outlined in orange shows the requirement for development for one um, for sale unit. The City of Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley do not have a in lieu requirement for one single unit. Both Watsonville and the county have an in lieu fee. Um, in terms of additions, only the county requires an in lieu fee for an addition along with Capitola. Under the AB 1600 Mitigation Fee Act, um, cities may charge impact fees to new developments that offset the impacts new developments cause on public services. To comply with the Mitigation Fee Act and the Takings Clause of the U.S. Constitution, there must be an essential nexus between the development and the impacts that the fee seeks to mitigate. And the development fee must be roughly proportional to the development's impact. Before adopting an impact fee on development, the city must complete a nexus study to determine what impact the development has on the city's affordable housing stock. The impact fee is then based on the, that study. After preparing and adopting the study and imposing the fee, the city must prepare an annual report providing specific information about those fees. The nexus study must be updated periodically. In general, a nexus study costs around $35,000 and takes approximately two months to complete. The nexus study must be updated periodically. On average, the city um, currently receives approximately $50,000 per year in in lieu affordable housing fees from um, one unit single family projects and additions greater than 50%. That figure varies year by year depending on the number of projects the city processes. So within policy item three, we're asking um, what should the city require of the larger additions and the smaller developments. Staff suggests that the city implement an affordable housing impact fee for single family development with only one unit or an addition to the single family home and require developments with two to six units to provide one affordable unit on site or pay an in lieu fee that varies based on the square footage of the proposed development. So now we'll move on to policy item number four. Should the city structure the IHO requirement to allow an option for developers to pay in lieu fees? for the larger development. Um, as previously discussed, the city requires developers to provide on-set affordable housing for developments with seven or more units. The requirement is 15% of the total units must be deed restricted affordable. In this policy discussion, we are asking if the inclusionary housing ordinance should be updated to add an in-lieu fee option to the on-site affordable housing requirement. In this slide, I compare the speed, effectiveness, and cost of on-site affordable housing development and in lieu fees. There are, of course, benefits and challenges to both. On-site affordable housing is faster with production occurring at the time of the development and results in affordable units distributed within development projects throughout the city. If the city were to add an alternative to allow a developer to pay an in lieu fee rather than develop on site, more funds would be available to the city to partner with um, nonprofits and developers on affordable housing projects. The benefit to having more funds available is that more funds could be leveraged uh, to partner with developers and nonprofits to result in possibly in larger affordable housing projects with more units. Also, larger affordable housing projects are typically managed by nonprofits and funded through state housing programs. So the ongoing administrative cost is typically lower for these larger projects. Um, for policy item four, we are asking should the city restructure the IHO requirements to allow options for developers to pay in lieu fees for larger projects. Staff is recommending updating the IHO to allow this option. Um, policy item five is a discussion on, the, on consolidating all asset limitations in the IHO and increasing asset limitations for affordable senior units. 
The city adopted an asset limitation in the IHO in 2013 to ensure that applicants with high assets um, and therefore who do not likely need assistance to purchase housing even if they have lower annual income did not absorb the city's limited supply of affordable units. Only households which qualify as very low, low, median, or moderate income households and who meet the asset limitation of one and a half times the income limit are eligible to purchase affordable units. Likewise, in 2014, the City Council adopted an administrative policy, 3-16, implementing the asset limitations in the IHO to potential buyers of mobile homes in mobile home parks governed by affordable housing deed restrictions within the city. The asset limit for mobile home parks in the administrative policy mirrors the asset limits in the IHO. One and a half times the buyer's income with the addition of an exception of up to 500,000 in qualified retire account, account. Funds used to purchase an affordable housing unit are not counted as assets for purposes of determining eligibility. Even with the asset limitations in place, the city continues to receive requests for exceptions from the asset restrictions from interested buyers with assets beyond the asset limit. Most requests for exceptions to the asset limitations are from senior um, 55 plus buyers who are downsizing as part of their retirement plan. They combine the gains of the sale of their home with their retirement funds. Most prospective buyers have below 1 million in assets and the city has granted these requests. Two prospective buyers have had assets well in excess of a million dollars and those um, have been denied. Staff recommends that the IHO update be updated to explicitly apply to all asset, limitation, asset limitations to all affordable housing in the city, regardless of when it was constructed, and to consolidate all eligible eligibility requirements to be included in the IHO rather than requiring applicants to consult multiple sources. In addition, staff is recommending that the city include an increase to the asset to the existing asset limit for affordable housing units that are designated senior housing, 55 plus, from one and a half to three times the annual household limit, and increase the $500,000 exception in, in qualified retirement accounts to one million, increased annually according to the Consumer Price Index. These increases would allow more seniors to qualify to purchase affordable senior units. The buyer's income would continue to be limited to the moderate household income identified in the previous table. This evening, staff is requesting direction from City Council on consolidating asset limits within the IHO and the staff recommended modification to the asset limit. Lastly, staff is looking for direction on policy item number six, should the city include additional alternatives to on-site production and in lieu of these within the IHO. Many jurisdictions include alternatives to boost affordable housing production in additional requirements uh, requiring on-site affordable units or in lieu of these. Land dedications, off-site affordable housing production, and the acquisition and rehabilitation of existing units subject to new affordability covenants are common alternatives um, compliance measures. The council may discuss these or other options and if the council desires to explore them further, staff will bring back more information during future meetings. Also, if council does not want to incorporate other alternatives at this time, council may direct staff to research additional alternatives during the 2023 housing element update. That concludes my presentation. Um, before you is the summary of the policy questions. I'm happy to answer any questions prior to going to public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, let's turn it over to council for any questions. Uh, we'll do the, the questions one at a time. So let's start with uh, any council members that have questions on policy uh, number one. And I see council member story has got his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank, Katie, thanks for that uh, update. Um, and I, I had a couple questions and, um, and, and the first one uh, 
in one of your early slides, you showed a change in the numbers, uh, I guess the need for low income uh, and very low income housing. Did I get that, understand that right? That it, it had dropped from when we had um, originally um, kept track of those numbers? Correct. So the demand um, has decreased in from the uh, 2011 numbers. Right. The, and uh, I guess, yeah, my question was, do we have an understanding of why that demand has dropped? I, um, I'm, I'm thinking due to either increase in um, salaries as well as people moving out or um, in the event that somebody passes on and the home is resold. So during, during resales and also increases in payment in salary. Okay. Um, is there a possibility that because affordability has just become so much more difficult that the, the extremely low and very low are, aren't even, they're not as much making an effort um, to reside in Capitola? Um, you know, th there's a, a term called gentrification of when uh, people cannot afford to live in a place that they get displaced. And I think that is part of what you're probably seeing in those numbers is people that have not been able to be able to afford to live in Capitola who have moved and folks with higher incomes moving into those units. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. My, my other question, and this is relevant to policy number one, and the 15%, I noticed that um, that there's no, uh, and one, it seems like we have very few inclusionary units in Gapitola. Um 12, I think, was the number you reported. Um, but one of the, uh, and um, one of the threshold requirements is that that only applies to developments that have seven plus units. Um, and I'm just thinking, I mean, Capitola is mostly built out do we know how many opportunity sites there are that may accommodate seven plus units? Um, and typically we see these as redevelopments when a larger parcel um, is looking to possibly be subdivided. Um, I don't have a, an exact number for you on that, but um, you are right in that we are, we, we don't have very many vacant lots at this point, so any of our larger lots would be a redevelopment project. And so if we really wanted to increase the number of inclusionary housing, we'd either have to raise the percentage, but staff is not recommending that, or lower the number of units that it would apply to, which I, which I saw in comparison, the city of Santa Cruz has um, lower um, inclusionary figures for lower numbers of units? Which um, we are recommending under a different policy is to require um, an inclusionary unit for more than one unit on the site. So once you build two, to require an inclusionary unit. But we can talk about that when we get to policy number three. Yeah, but I, but your the staff is recommending that we retain the, the inclusionary percentage at fifteen percent. But but I and I assume the staff is also recommending that we keep it that it only applies when there's more than seven units. Correct. And I guess my question is, it seems to me that that would be very I mean rarely used in capital any longer that we would have development of seven units or more. Um, is, is my sense correct or? You know, um, within the new zoning code update, one thing to keep in mind is that we added mixed use to um, our community commercial zone and um, in the regional commercial area as well. So we may start seeing more applicants come in with mixed use projects than previously, but um, you are correct in that we're limited in land and most, most projects would be redevelopment projects in which there's already existing units might be torn down and rebuilt. Yeah, okay. 
All right, thank you. Those were my questions for now. Can I just chime in very quickly to respond to, to the question you asked there, Sam? And I think I think it's a very relevant one, which is how many units, you know, this, this inclusionary ordinance has been in effect for more than 15 years, and we have 12 units, and eight of them came from one project, Villas, right? And I think realistically looking ahead, the way to get a significant number of housing units, affordable housing units, is either A, to have projects like the villas or maybe like the Capitol Mall where there's a development agreement, or B, that we are able to accumulate housing trust funds. And back in the day, we used to have redevelopment funds to do this with, where we can partner with a nonprofit and then actually um, do these larger scale projects. I think at the end of the day, we're not gonna ever see too many units that are gonna come out of these seven, eight, nine unit projects. It's just, you know, over the next 10 years, my guess is it's three or four more units. Thank you. Right. Um, Council Member Bertrand, you have questions about policy number one? Yeah, in general, the threshold of 15%, and if we're actually trying to get uh, more money to accumulate so we actually have a good chance to partner, uh, maybe we should be going up to 20%. Um, just put that out there. Does um, anyone on staff have any experience with how city of Cap uh, city of Santa Cruz has gone on this and a little follow-up on Sam's question which I haven't thought about asking this but it, it didn't seem unique that they have a different approach um, they actually want more units depending on how many um, more inclusionary units depending on how many are actually being built so those are the two questions I'm wondering about what other communities around here have had in terms of their 20% inclusionary fee, and um, in particular, what Santa Cruz has had in their experience with requiring more inclusionary units for uh, smaller development projects. So I can tell you that they require 20, 20%. I'm not sure what their overall numbers are at in terms of how many affordable units they have and how successful it's been. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, just walking around town, I know there's a lot of rather large lots. Um, you brought up zoning changes uh, for um, multi-use homes. And um, I think on Portola, you know, Capitola, excuse me, but you know, that whole um, tool belt area, there's rather large lots. You don't notice them because they're behind big walls. We do have enough. You, you muted yourself at the end there, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, can you repeat the end of that, that question? Um, um, thank you. I believe we do have a number of rather large lo lots. Um, I just mentioned on Capitola Road, there's, there's about two that I can think of, maybe more depending on how you count them. And then in that toolbox area, there's a, a number of uh, parcels that, that are fairly large. I don't think you could get the same amount as we did on 38th, but you know, maybe four or five or, or so. So one of the things to keep in mind, Councilmember Bertrand, is as the percentage of affordability requirements go up, what it does is it increases the overall development costs for a project. And so we have not done that kind of study where we analyze sort of the local real estate market and the development costs and figure out kind of where the potential thresholds are. In general, the reports I've seen are that 20% starts to become infeasible, and it starts to drive projects into to, you have to charge more for the remaining units than you can get on the market, and so they're not likely to be built. So that's one of the balancing acts with inclusionary is, is that you, you get some deed restricted units, but then at the end of the day, the developers, if they're gonna build the project, they need to be making up the cost somewhere else by getting more revenue off the other, charging more for the other projects. So. We didn't come with a difference and we're sort of recommending the 15% because it seems like that's been a number that works for us. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. I think one of the 
uh, if I may, Mary, uh, one of the issues is how much the upfront costs are, as you just mentioned, and if the fees are graduated in terms of when they're paid, like within four years, five years, or something like that, the upfront cost is, is not as dramatic. I think there's ways we can deal with that, but um, I agree with you. I don't quite understand what the balance is. So if we could do anything to make that balance a little bit more in the direction of creating affordable housing, I think that's a plus. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Any more questions about policy number one? Seeing none, are there any council questions? Oh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yes, sorry. Um, so my question is, is in, in your staff recommendation is to main status Quo, and you showed us the amount of inclusionary housing, but the, you haven't shown us the where we are with our arena numbers. Where are we with meeting our arena numbers currently? And the second part of that question is um, to Jacques and Sam's point is that it looks like if we're, we're not meeting our arena numbers, then we're not doing a good job in building additional affordable housing. And so this question on policy one actually does, to set from Council Member Story's point, really does correlate to policy question number four. Those two things tie hand in hand about whether we should include an in fee or not. So my question specifically again is, where do we stand with our, cur um, with our current RENA numbers and how many projects have we seen come and and go because they couldn't meet the 15% threshold at this point? Or was it that they didn't build because we just didn't have space? So that's where I'm kind of getting hung up on. So when we make this kind of policy question, you know, I don't know where, where the blame goes per se, if it's our percentage or if it's just because we don't have space. Okay, so first I'll hit upon the RENA numbers. Um, on our RENA numbers, we have not come close to meeting our RENA numbers. So for above moderate income, um, we're meeting those numbers. So our redevelopment of, uh, of new, or development of new single family homes, we meet the RENA numbers for, we've almost met the number for uh, above moderate income. So sure. Um, market rate housing. In terms of meeting the arena numbers, when it's broken down into low, very low, um, and, and affordability rates, we have produced in the in the last arena cycle one new unit at Terra Court. So we're that we're not meeting. We're not close to meeting our arena numbers in that aspect. Um, but in the Second question about um, the, you know, what 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 examples of projects that have come through and why haven't we met those? You know, we actually had one density bonus application come through; it was approved, but in the end, the um, it didn't pencil for the developer, and they ended up reselling it. And on that site, um, built three units rather than the seven-unit project that would have given us. Uh, through the uh, density bonus, actually, it was, it was 10 units total between the two properties. We just gotten two new affordable units out of that project. Um, it didn't pencil out, and so that's where there's this definite, uh, we've got to find that happy medium between what our requirements are so that developers can come in and build these um, affordable units, and it's not too much of a cost burden. There's another point I'd like to chime in on this is that I think at this stage, there's only about 13 cities around the state that are meeting the RENA obligations. Um, and a large part of that is due to the fact that the redevelopment agencies no longer exist. And redevelopment agencies used to provide housing set-aside funds that cities would use to provide that kind of capital seed money to build these important projects at those lower income levels. It's very hard to see a very low or low income project, um, a very low income projects, you really need to have those kinds of projects. Your IHO is never gonna get it for you by itself. 
you need a program like the Bay Avenue Senior Project where we use the million dollars of redevelopment agency funds as seed money that was able to leverage, I think it was like 40 million other dollars to renovate the Bay Avenue Senior site, add the units and get it all done. So, um, so in a sense, the key to meeting ARENA at this point is having a pot of money so you can get the very low projects done, but at the same time also then seeing the market rate projects that come along and help with the moderate income and the, the, the higher affordability levels. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. I, I will add some comments to your point, um, city manager, later um, when it's comment time. Um, so that's all I have for questions for policy one. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional council questions from policy one? Okay, we'll move on to questions on policy two. We're just at questions right now. We'll come back for comments after we go to public comment, but just questions. Policy two, seeing none, any questions on policy three? Seeing none, any questions on policy four? Okay, uh, policy five, questions? Okay, and finally, any questions on policy six? Oh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, I just need some more explanation about policy six. It just seems that's like a broad, open-ended, what do you want to do with alternatives sort of thing. I just needed some more clarification on that. Thank you. So um, for this policy question, we're asking, should we come back with other alternatives? Right now within our um, IHO, it's limited to on-site production and in the ECU. Um, if you'd like, we can come back with more information on land dedication. Some IHOs include land dedication, off-site affordable housing. So when a development happens, they're not required to always build it on-site, but there's an option to build it off-site, um, which is tricky here in Capitola because as we've talked about, there's not much land available for either land dedications or off-site development. Um, you typically would find that in a less urban area in which there's plenty of land to be developed for the school. And one that could apply to Capitola is the acquisition and rehabilitation of existing units. So a developer buying existing units and then um, rehabbing them and de-restricting them as affordable units, that one could, could be utilized possibly in Capitola because of uh, the amount of development we do have. That could use updating. So, so that was just a, a question of would you like us to come back with more information on that? And I also outlined in my presentation that the next time that we're updating the housing element in um, in a couple of years, we could also dig deeper into that during the housing element update and bring you more information on those options if you'd rather not um, bring it into this update currently. <coughs> Thank you. All right, I think Council Member Story had his hand up and then we'll go back to Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I actually had a question about policy number two. Um, I just didn't, I wasn't able to chime in fast enough as you were going with that. So if I may, um, I'd like to ask um, uh, the staff recommendation on policy two is that we eliminate the um, in lieu fee um, for rental uh, housing, um, and I was my question would uh, is how much are we talking about that uh, the city would lose in in lieu fees if we were to do that? And I guess I know you can't project what housing may be built over the next five years, but if we had implemented this over the last five years, or how much would we have lost in in lieu fees? I don't believe that the city has um, permitted a rental housing project since the, um, or has, there's, I don't believe that there's been a rental housing project that's been built since the IHO, to the best of my knowledge. Um, Katie, can you help me out? Um, yeah, I can. I can chime in on this one. So the, I think the only uh, rental housing project that we've seen is one on Capitola Avenue for four units that's yet to be built. Um, 
those are, those are not condominiumized. And then one across the street from City Hall, which was two units above a commercial, well, just a, a duplex there. But that, um, yeah, we have not, those are the two that I've seen come through the city in my seven plus years here. And do you have a guesstimate as to how much the in lieu fees were for those two projects? Um, so the in lieu fee for the one up the street, I'm not sure what the overall square footage was, but I would estimate somewhere in the, um, so the fourplex, approximately 4,000 square feet um, at $6 a square foot. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll go next to uh, Council Member Bertrand had his hand up, and then after that, we'll go to Council Member Bosworth. Yeah, I, I had a question about two, but I guess the agreement with the mall would be uh, separate than this if we struck the fees. That's correct. The mall um, will be undergoing a development agreement with the mall, and it wouldn't be subject to the, there would be an agreement in place for affordable housing. Okay, and I'd like to come back later uh, the questions talk about six. Thank you. Hey, Council Member Bosworth. Uh, uh, Council Member Tran asked my exact question. I didn't want to uh, establish something in policy C that uh, would affect them all, but uh, Katie answered that, so thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, you said you had another question about policy six? Yeah, yes, I did. I. Um, I'm very encouraged that this was put up because I think there's a lot that we need to think about to, as um, Yvette brought up, you know, we're not meeting our requirements and yes, uh, the state may be deficient also, but, you know, maybe we can think of ways to solve these problems in different ways. Um, in a way, this is a question, um, Katie, because you deal with permits, it seems to me and ask, tell me if I'm wrong and give me a sense of how wrong I am or how right I am, that most of our permits are single homes. We're doing improvements. We're doing upgrades. Uh, we're tearing it down, building, you know, something, you know, much better from someone's standpoint, I guess. And so in a sense, the second question is our fees, whether they're 15% or we raise them up to 20% will generate money to help us leverage. As Jamie mentioned, we need to have some way to gen uh, generate money to leverage. Um, and over time, we could accumulate a pot of funds so we could actually accomplish a project with Mercy Housing, South Bay Housing, South County Housing, or something else like that. So those are my two questions. <clears throat> so um, building up our fees would help definitely in leveraging um, for future projects. And I I didn't catch the first question. In that. The first question was, um, I don't have an overall sense of what kind of permits we're giving yeah. out, but it's my sense that we're doing a lot of single family home yeah. improvements, construction, uh, you know, an old house that is clearly falling apart, they're rebuilding it, that kind of thing. So I just want to get a sense there. And if that's the case, then our major way to raise money, and that was the second question, is whatever in lieu fees we, we charge them. Correct. So as the city manager mentioned earlier, the majority of our development has been to single family homes and uh, for sale projects. So. As you're, uh, when we look at our in lieu fee and where the project, where the money has come from, it's been just that the development of single family homes and additions makes up, I would estimate, over 95%, if, if not higher, of our in lieu fees that we've taken in at the city level. So it's not from, we don't have very many multifamily projects that come through the city, and we definitely have very few rental projects that come through the city. So a uh, follow-up question, if I may, Mayor. So do you think taking away the fees from uh, rentals, et cetera, would start skewing things in a different way? Maybe that would be good. 
Well, the reason why we were suggesting taking away the rental fee is so that developers may be more enticed to produce rental housing. Right. Uh, rental housing is definitely, actually, Pepco is a really healthy mix within our, um, within the types of housing we have in, in our community. We're about 50% rental and 50% ownership. We haven't had new rental uh, uh, applications or development projects come in in the recent, in the last decade, very minimal. So we were thinking by possibly removing that in Lucy for rental, maybe it would be more enticing for developers to come in with rental projects, which are definitely a, a more affordable option for um, market rate versus uh, more affordable than buying a condominium or a, new, or a home. So Thank you. it's definitely a necessary part of the housing ladder. All right, any additional council questions on any of these six policy questions? Going once. Councilmember Bertrand, do you have your hand up again? Yes, I do, sorry. Um, so I was talking about six, I'm, I'm glad staff uh, put this in and I, I do support the idea that um, we have some concerted effort to try to come up with options uh, one that came to mind is the difficulty in managing um, restricted um, units, uh, low-income units that we made possible through our zoning codes and our policies. And a way to uh, deal with that, I think, um, which might have additional benefits, is to create a land trust for Capitola. And so that agency would, would manage these, and we might be able to uh, get funds from other directions to uh, support the acquisition, which was sort of mentioned a little bit uh, in the presentation, acquisition of land, and put that in the land trust, and then they would take care of all the, the paperwork and manage that so that, indeed, our policy of trying to provide low-income housing and our policy to make it easy for people to afford homes in Capitola, which, as you said, helps create a balanced community, and I totally support a balanced community. So if we come up with options with that discussion in six, I wouldn't want to wait to the upgrade, <laughs> the update. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I just want to confirm that this is the time for questions. Do you have a question? I know, I know, I know. Okay, okay. so okay. There's, there's no more questions? No more questions. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you for comments as soon as we go to public comment. I just want to make sure that, that we're aware now is the time for questions only. Okay, and I, I'm seeing no additional questions from council members. So with that, we're gonna bring this to uh, public comment and then we'll come back for additional comments uh, from council. So I'm gonna turn it over to Larry. Mayor Peterson, um, I have a couple hands at this point. So first is David DiBiase. You should be able to unmute and speak. Is that better? Does that work? Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. I want to thank you all for your hard work on our behalf as you uh, face what must be uh, innumerable problems as you struggle through the COVID crisis. I live in Loma Vista Estates, which is a 55 plus 90 unit development on Clare Street. And uh, we sent you 91 letters and signed petition signatures uh, on this topic of asset limit. Uh, I would like to encourage the council to please read the letter from our attorney where she explains in great detail not only the legal basis that controls the regulatory agreement, which has been in force for years between Loma Vista and the city, um, but it's also the controlling document between the city and us and, and, and has always been. Uh, it, however, listening to the staff earlier, I think there is some substantial misunderstanding that I think could be clarified by reading our attorney's comments, giving the history and legal basis uh, that they are basing uh, the uh, the position that we have. 
uh, it appears that staff is recommending the city no longer honor the asset limit for new buyers in our park that we agreed to uh, with the city uh, through our regulatory agreement. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we've been through this stance before. The city came to us before and wanted to do something. We had a meeting in the park, and 90% of the people, we had over half the park show up, and 90% of the people said no to the city. So this is just part two revisited. The, the legal and binding regulatory agreement is still in place. It still stands. It was bilateral. took many months between you and us, reviewed by your legal counsel by our legal counsel we've acted on it and we've had to write multiple letters to the city because they often go off the uh, ranch and try to impose things unilaterally that they're not legally entitled to try because they're bound by the regulatory agreement so i want to thank you again and i would highly encourage you to read the letter from the attorney so you get a 360 view based on the law and the other citations she included in the document. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now, now we have Karen. You can you can unmute and speak now. Hi, City Council. Um, I'm talking on number five, and I'm a senior, and I'm not in. A senior park. I'm in Turner Lane, and I'm having real difficulties um, selling my house. And I was hoping that it wouldn't put a restriction on 55 and over parks. <laughs> That's my question. Thank you, Karen. Do we have any additional public comment on this item? I I have two emails, and I'll try and get those. With uh, shared and uh, read online. And Larry, it looks like if I'm not misunderstanding, it looks like two of those are from the same um, email address. So we're, we're only addressing the, the one. Okay, I will. I will take a look and see. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to read this one aloud. I'm going to have the computer do it. Hello, Mayor and Council members. I am Rhonda Trimble, and. I and I live in Loma Vista Estates. My husband and I moved into our home in 2004. When we bought into Loma Vista, we understood there were restrictions placed on homeowners because of the regulatory agreement made in 2000 between the City of Capitola and Loma Vista Homeowners Association. The city specified certain regulations and the association agreed to follow them. In 2004 when the city wanted to make a change in the agreement and the association agreed to the change, it was mutually beneficial. Now the city wants to make changes to the contract without the agreement of the association by using an IHO ordinance to circumvent normal negotiating procedure. The city presented proposed. Proposed changes several years ago. The homeowners listened to the city's request and understood it did not benefit them. We even had an election so the city could clearly understand that the homeowners were overwhelmingly opposed to the changes in the agreement. Now, because current negotiations are not producing the outcome the city desires, the city is trying to slip through an item in the IHO ordinance that affects the regulatory agreement they have with Loma Vista. I personally think this is a sneaky way to circumvent legal process. The change in how assets are counted for potential buyers is not beneficial for the residents in Loma Vista. Our homes currently sell at lower prices compared to other resident-owned parks in the city. This is because of the regulatory agreement. 
New restrictions on potential buyers will only cause a reduction in buyers for our homes. That will cause a loss of value for current homeowners. When our park was bought by the residents, the city of Capitola was happy to help. It granted us money, with conditions, in the form of the regulatory agreement, to assist in the sale. The regulatory agreement states in Section 6.9 amendments slash this agreement may be amended only by a written instrument executed by all the parties hereto or their successors in title, and duly recorded in the real property records of the County of Santa Cruz, California. In the First Amendment, Section 3 states, Full force and effect. Except as set forth in this First Amendment, the regulatory agreement has not been amended and is in full force and effect. Mayor and City Council members, I urge you to reject policy item number 5 as part of the IHO. Respectfully submitted. Rhonda Trimble. Okay, so, so let me see if the other, if the, if the other one's from the same email address. It is not um, from someone else. Um, and my apologies. No, that's fine. I, all right. Um, I'll try and get the right one this time, sorry. Wife and I have lived at Loma Vista Estates Mobile Home Park for 16 years. Loma Vista is a senior park. We've enjoyed living in a resident-owned park where our members manage the park and decide upon the rent. The concept is, we all own our homes and we rent our spaces. Our rent is about $400 per month which includes a park mortgage payment of $164 per member. We are all volunteers, no employees. Loma Vista is a solid community, where neighbors help their neighbors. Every election, politicians walk our park. We have about 125 residents. The politicians tell us that we are heavy voters. I'm sure that has nothing to do with our waistlines. Council members, we have a contract with the city and we have performed under that contract for 20 years. What possible benefit could the city receive by ignoring our contract? What would motivate the city to damage our property values? I'd sure like to know the answer to those questions. Thank you and good evening. Okay, that, those are the two comments. Um, All right, uh, thank you so much for those who've offered public comment, both uh, via Zoom and in email. I will bring it back to council for uh, discussion uh, and guidance on moving forward. Uh, does anyone have any comments? I don't see any hands raised. Maybe a moment of thought among the council members. Council member Botor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. We uh, uh, kind of goes across the line on a lot of the issues. I know something came up about the reading of numbers, and there was also something about, uh, you know, in, additional alternatives, and there was a lot of discussion about um, uh, our, our city being built out and not having a lot of property left to develop on. I, I think what we need to really look at, you know, a lot of these, uh, I know we need to do this, uh, this, this policy is definitely needs to be updated, and we need to make sure that we give our best effort to doing that, but fundamentally, how I see Capitola moving forward is there's two opportunities. Uh, uh, Lena numbers are something that we, we've always been behind on ever since I got on the council. Uh, and as I think as the city manager mentioned, most cities don't catch up. But keep in mind that uh, should the mall be a, a, a productive product that we engage in, uh, we will not only meet, but we will exceed our arena numbers with the potential development there for years to come. Um, and the other option is that the way I see um, us meeting arena numbers regardless of the mall is I think that because of the state and programs with ADUs, this is really the new way that we actually address affordable housing and, and, and provide uh, opportunities to meet the numbers 
provide the housing and actually assist homeowners, uh, some, some of them, the ability to stay in their home. So uh, I, I'm not too concerned about whether we have uh, parcels to develop or, or how, how we're going to allocate money or I don't want to create a burden with a lot of these policies that it's something for the city to manage because I think moving forward that uh, that's going to be the future of how we meet our, uh, our, our, our state green energy. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Botchworth. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, I think it's my responsibility to ensure that we do our best in creating um, inclusionary housing within our community. And um, it's my responsibility to familiarize myself on where we are um, currently with, um, with the units we have. And it's also my responsibility to create policy that will be beneficial long term. And inclusionary housing means to create housing throughout an entire community, not necessarily just in one place like the mall. And I don't want to bank on just the mall. Um, and to really ensure that we create opportunities for all types of families to, to be able to live and afford to live here, from young families to retirees and so forth. So I feel like that's my responsibility to really be thoughtful about the policy we create, as well as to, um, even though it may be work for our staff, um, it's, it's the job and the task of our of staff to to um, to look at this. So I just have a quick question, Katie. Do you want us to go one by one on each policy and kind of where um, we'd like to, some, some general direction? Is that what you'd like? That would be helpful. I'm gonna look to the mayor if you wanna take go through each policy mayor and get direction or have each council member go through each policy for us? Yeah, let's, let's go through each of the policy items one at a time and then uh, as we go through, if, if any of the council members have uh, comments, we can they can make them at that time. Mayor Peterson, do you want me just to continue with policy one then? Yes, please. Okay, so just for policy one, um, I agree with staff's recommendations to maintain the percentage. However, I'd like for us to look at um, the option of uh, reducing the seven to something less. So I saw an option like five or six or something like that. As noted, there's not many places for complexes of seven plus. Um, our, our city manager mentioned that, you know, there's an option to pay and lose fees, which we'll get to in policy four. But what I want to say about that is that ideally in all of these policies that we um, make decisions on today, my goal would be that we ensure that we build housing now. There's a need for housing now and to bank on uh, collecting money for us to, to to put aside to do to build other projects in the near future. I don't know how likely that is, and maybe that's something staff could come back to on really what those partnerships should look like for us should we create um, in lieu fees as an option. Um, so that, that would be just my direction for policy one at this point. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooke. Uh, I think uh, Jacques, uh, Council Member Bertrand had his hand up and then we'll go to Council Member Bossler. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I think our journey has gone along with these that I think Sam brought this up in terms of what um, the City of Santa Cruz does. Um, instead of having a limit of seven divided up so that we get housing um, for smaller projects uh, that are inclusionary. Um, another way to look at it, and, and I'm thinking, you know, staff could, you know, when they come back to present some options based on this discussion, not necessarily a definite direction at this point, but another option would be um, to give the developers some leeway in, in how they meet the requirements. And one perhaps way to do that is um, in the inclusionary units, they don't have to be as large as the ones on the project right now. So the one on 38, if, if they had considered something that had several inclusionary units that were of smaller square footage, 
it was possible to develop for a lot less, but they could have built maybe two or three. Uh, that is an option. So the idea um, that Yvette just talked about, and also try to come up with options that uh, the developer can use to best meet our requirements to get inclusionary housing. And the one I just mentioned was uh, lower square footage units. I'd much rather have units rather than the fees. Uh, but if we're going to collect the fees, you know, maybe in a further discussion, we could increase that um, amount to 20%. Those are my comments on one. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, does any other, oh, Council Member Uh Thank you, Mayor. Uh, to, the, to the question, should the city maintain the existing required percentage at 15%, uh, my answer is yes. Thank you. All right. Any other council uh, discussion on policy item uh, one? Katie, do you feel that you have, um, I guess, uh, since we're not technically voting tonight, it says we're just uh, providing direction. Do you have, do you feel like you have direction on policy item one? Um, I, I'm wondering if Council Member Story would like to provide any feedback if there's support for maintaining at 15 percent. Yes, I, I support retaining it at 15 percent currently. Um, um, however, um, I also support um, giving the developer the option of paying in the fees um, and thereby um, reducing the number of units that that would apply to, um, similar to what the city of Santa Cruz has done. Um, and I, because, um, well, and if you, because if you don't do that, it, it, it ends up being more than 15% if you don't allow them the option of providing in lieu fees. Um, and, um, and I understand, yeah, it's better to have housing now than to have to wait. Um, but I think that one thing, if, if you have sufficient um, fees, um, they can be leveraged to benefit, I, I think, major large projects um, all at one fell swoon. That's what the Bay Avenue uh, Senior Housing Project um, was accomplished that way. Um, and so, um, and I believe trying to find this sweet spot of providing um, Kind of incentives to the developer, make giving them options of how they want to do it. I like what Shock mentioned about um, maybe they have the option of building um, more smaller units. And I think having that, providing that kind of flexibility, um, may move us forward uh, to being able to encourage developers to build more um, units in Capitola. And so, um, I think so. Yeah, I, I'm 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 in support of uh, keeping it at 15 percent, but lowering the number of units. And I think that uh, that also means uh, giving the option of in the fees. Um, and um, so, I hope that answers your question, Katie. Thank you. Councilmember Botworth, do you have your hand up for additional comments on policy item one? I'm going to take it down right now. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Okay, we're going to move on then to policy uh, question number two. Should developments of renting units be exempt from the IHO? Do any council members have comments on this item? Councilmember Botworth. Uh, yes, they should be exempt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council Member Story, and then we'll go to Council Member Bertrand. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, it, it almost, with so few rental units being developed in Capitola, you know, over the past several years, it's, it's, um, it's almost a new point. Um, uh, however, one thing I, I, I've noticed that what the City of Salinas has done that for rental units is they um, 
to have a couple of levels. I think it's five dollars a square foot, but down to two dollars a square foot. Uh, if the developer is willing to accept subsidized housing, the vouchers within their project. Um, and I say that if we're going to be eliminating or reducing the number of fees, that there'd be some sort of trade off that uh, they'd be willing to accept um, the Section 8 housing or other subsidized housing that we may be able to provide you know, using or whatever in those fees we may have or what rental assistance fees that we may have. So that's just, you know, a, a trade-off that I'd like to see on that item. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Curry. Council Member Bertrand? Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a problem with uh, reducing the fees to zero. Um, in general, I feel when a development happens in any community, there's going to be an impact, and in this case, it's a housing development, and their impact should help us solve our problems. Their particular project won't do it, but an accumulation of everyone's fees will help continue that. So I think we should have a little more discussion on this point. Um, I would like to keep the fees in place. But Sam had me thinking that if we lower the fee, I, I don't want to get rid of it, but if we lower the fee and there's something we get out of it that's a benefit, then um, maybe that's worth discussion. So when staff comes back, maybe there could be some examples like Salinas and other areas around here. Um, and, you know, if that's a way uh, we could get some leverage out of lowering these fees, then I would support uh, the city going in a different direction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I appreciate staff attaching the um, MBAP white paper to our staff report. It touches on this item pretty significantly. And so therefore, I'm in favor of removing rental units, they should be exempt from the IHO. Um, I would, would like to see more information further on what Council Member Story is referring to at our next meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, Katie, do you uh, feel that you have general consensus from the Council on Policy 2? I do. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Peterson, let me just kind of chime in for a second here. Um, it might be helpful to hear your perspective on that, on this item. I know, I know, I missed it if you did give us your feedback. No, I haven't. I, I typically uh, just kind of stay quiet if what I was going to say has already been said. But um, yeah, no, I agree. The um, the development of the rental units, having them exempt from the from the IHO, I think, um, as the end up white paper mentioned. Um, Exempting them provides the opportunity for additional uh, development of, of rental units that otherwise, uh, as mentioned in the example from staff, might not be built or might not be built with as many units as they would have if they if they have to pay these kind of fees. Um, so, so I'm in agreement um, with with my fellow council members on this one. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, and just a, a reminder to those watching and listening to council tonight is uh, there will not be a vote on this. We are providing uh, guidance to staff and staff will return uh, with a first reading at a future, at a future meeting. Um, so policy number three, what is the guidance we would like to give the staff on uh, what the city should require of developers of large additions to existing home and smaller one to six unit development? And if we can go back the um, suggestion from staff, the staff uh, recommendation was to implement impact fees for single family development and, and Development of two to six units, is that correct? Am I reading that correctly? That's correct. Um, I'm pulling up the slide to show you our staff recommendation on this. That'd be great, thank you. Um, so our staff recommendation here was to implement an affordable housing impact fee for single family development with 
only one unit or in addition to a single family home and then require development of two to six units to provide one affordable unit or pay the annual fee based on the square footage of the unit. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, so I, I'm okay with moving forward on implementing the nexus study to, to determine what impact development has on the city's affordable housing stock. I'm in favor of that. Um, but to kind of go back to policy number one as we examine, and Katie, please jump in if I'm mm -hmm. mixing two things. Um, but since we've just asked for information to come back regarding seven plus units or a different number, I don't know that the staff recommendations would go, would coincide. So I'm fine with going, moving forward with the next study um, and then looking at our options thereafter regarding the two different units at, um, at that point. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. I believe, and I apologize, I didn't see whose hand went up first, but I believe it was Council Member Story and then Council Member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, and I agree with uh, Councilwoman Brooks about doing the next study. Um, I think we should look at uh, in those fees for the two to six unit development, because those, um, those are done by developers, right? And so, um, and I think that does have an impact upon uh, our ability to provide affordable housing. I'm more reluctant to apply um, uh, an in the fee to a single, you know, family development um, or an addition to a single family home. But that, I think that impacts a lot of local residents or are maybe trying to expand or up, upgrade their home. And it just adds more cost. I would want to see what those additional costs are going to be um, for residents. Um, and I also, you know, one, I guess one observation I've seen in, concerning the single family residents, I mean, you know, people who are um, coming in and developing second homes and vacation homes and taking those, that housing stock out of our local market, I think does impact um, our um, availability of uh, housing stock and therefore the price of housing. Um, but I, I would be curious about whether we are able to even process and distinguish for the single family development uh, between um, you know local um, owner occupied development and other developments which are for vacation homes um, Airbnb um, or, or even for uh, rarely um, used second homes um, so those are my thoughts on that on that subject Do you uh, want to see if, if staff has an answer to that, council member story, on if we can um, differentiate between owner-occupied and vacation homes? I think if they're, if they're coming back to us, I would just maybe put that out there and, and have them, I mean, I would like to maybe see an analysis of that. Um, but, I mean, if they want to, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, dismiss it out of hand and, um, um, I, I'm fine with that as well, um, but um, it. But I would, if that's the case, I wouldn't want to see uh, if there's going to be impact fees or in lieu fees on single family development. Um, I certainly want to see what those um, costs would be uh, to local residents. Okay. All right. Maybe that's something you can bring back. Um, yeah. Discuss this again. Yeah, we can. I can bring back more information on that. Awesome, thank you, uh, Councilmember Bertrand. You're still muted, Councilmember Bertrand. Doc, are you still with us, or did you freeze? Oh no, there you are. You're still muted. There you go. Okay. Um, uh, so I generally support the staff recommendation here, and again, 
I'd like to support in the teams because you know, I think that contributes in the long run to uh, helping our community solve problems. Um, you know, I think the Bay Area, some of the cities in the Bay Area have uh, ordinances that deal with assessing fees to vacation homes and stuff like that because again, vacation homes take away from you know, vibrant communities the people on them aren't here that much not on an everyday basis. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bosworth, do you have comments? Yeah, I am basically uh, uh, in support of the Nexus uh, a plan to establish an impact scheme. I think that the Nexus report should uh, give us an insight as to how we are affected by either an addition or a single family dwelling and what that report gives us and how we can face that fee. With regard to the uh, uh, development, I'm okay with a uh, in lieu fee for two to six. I'm not really uh, interested in providing a unit. I think that we're better off using the in lieu fee to, to create a fund to do a, a bigger project than to have uh, one decision type of development. And uh, um, I'm not uh, I'm not taking a position to oppose vacation rentals or how people choose to use their property. I think we're getting on a uh, very you know, ground when we start making restrictions on uh, assessing fees to what's a vacation rental and how that affects, uh, you know, uh, our property. I think that uh, some people who are buying second homes and who have uh, built these properties, uh, their property is assessed at a newer rate, which generates a whole lot more money for revenue for the city of Capitola. And I think there has to be some conscious recognition of uh, Necessary revenue for the run the city. Those are my comments. Thank you, Councilmember Bosmer. Uh, I am also in favor of the Nexus study. I would be interested, however, in hearing um, a little bit more on the concept of the difference between uh, the fees for single family homes that are owner occupied and those that are um, essentially vacation uh, homes or vacation rentals. Uh, is there any other comments on policy item three? All right, seeing none. Katie, we're good on, on number three? Yes. Let me pull up the. Give me one moment to pull this up. All right, so we're moving on to number four. Uh, should the city structure the IHO? Oops, should the city structure the IHO requirements to allow an option for developers to pay in lieu fees? And uh, Katie, would you mind pulling up the staff recommendation slide for this, just for a, a reminder? Yes. Thank you. So we are we are recommending um, that the city adopt an option for developers to pay the in lieu fee. So this is when there's um, one unit out of seven is required or we'd add an option to pay an in-room fee and we're recommending an option be added. Okay. Councilman Bosworth. Uh, I support policy four staff recommendation. Great, thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, I'm at this point I'm not in favor of creating an in lieu fee, so I'd like staff to come back with what those in lieu fees would be and uh, and some some options around that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, I'd be happy to learn more about what those fees would be. Um, Council Member Story, Council Member Bertrand, any uh, comments on uh, policy four? Um, I think you guys captured my comments. Okay. Yes, and I, I believe you guys have uh, as well. Um, I would be interested in, in seeing um, how much those fees may be uh, so we, we know uh, what we're uh, maybe approving. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
so Katie sounds like we're just looking for additional information on this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, moving on, policy five. Does the city council support staff staff recommended modifications to the asset limit? And it sounds like, I mean, it doesn't sound like we need to see the staff recommendation because it's mentioned in policy five, if, if we support staff recommendation modifications or not. Uh, I believe Vice Mayor Brooks had her hand up first and then we'll go to Council Member Yeah, at this point, I'm, I'm unsure about the direction that staff is giving. I just have a question if you guys could come back with it. Um, you made mention in the staff report about the consumer price index, and I'm just wondering how you got to that, um, and if you could break that in relation to all of the uh, mobile home parts. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Councilor Rosworth? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, with regard to this item, uh, I, I support staff recommendations to the, uh, the uh, uh, asset limits uh, modification to increase them. I, I want to keep in mind that, that you know, uh, my main concern on this topic is that I am trying to do whatever I can to make sure that we provide affordable housing and affordable senior units in this community. That's what my decisions are based on on this topic. So I'm uh, trying to be as flexible as I can to allow people uh, to get into those units, and I think that uh, I will uh, be okay with increasing that limit to try to accommodate that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bowser. I certainly echo your desire to ensure that we can get affordable housing throughout the, throughout the city. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, Council Member Story, any addition? Oh, Council Member Bertrand, you have your hand up. I, I support the sentiment um, that Ed has voiced. Um, Capital for a long time, if I may stray, has been very supportive of mobile homes and recognizes that the mobile homes that we have, we have a, a large percentage of rentals there, and home ownership actually is through that option. And it makes it very, very affordable to people who otherwise would not be able to live in a community as wonderful as ours. And um, I say that with complete sincerity. This is a program that we should help. And um, I think also raising limits in terms of access limits is in recognition of the fact that you know, people now um, have been able to save and support you know, retirement. These are generally for communities that are older 65 and older, and you know, they've been responsible, and I recognize that, and now they're able to, you know, get into a place that meets their needs as they age, and that's what we've done, and I think a lot of other people have done that too, so I support the general sentiment here, uh, especially at that uh, detail. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bob, you have your hand up again? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any additional comments on policy item five? No? Okay. Staff, do you have uh, general guidance? I think so. Um, Mayor Peterson, I, were, can you, were you in support of uh, Council Member Boschmer's comment? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the last one, policy item six. Does the city include additional alternatives to on-site production and in lieu feed within the IHO? So essentially the staff recommendation here is we either direct staff to bring back information during a future meeting on addition, additional alternatives for the IHO or postpone research on additional alternatives until the Next housing element update in 2023. Uh, we'll go to Council Member Bertrand and then Vice Mayor Brooks. Well, I, th I think um, with a great deal of thought and time to prepare, uh, staff could come up with some great recommendations and uh, policy discussion points. Um, I'll just go back to something that Ed mentioned earlier. And, you know, I think that now that we have 
uh, a great ADU ordinance, uh, this is probably going to be one of the better ways for us to expand housing. Um, I'm not too, I mean, I would like more rental housing, but I don't see that happening here. But I do see, because I see it all over my neighborhood, and when I walk the city, I see it, you know, people building uh, ADUs and trying to uh, basically provide for older relatives or even make the rent a little bit easier for them in terms of the houses that they own. And, and I think that's our future in many respects. It will, it will create a neighborhood that, um, well, that's nonetheless. I, I think when we uh, try to find ways to spend our money um, uh, that we've accumulated to the fees that we've added to development, uh, this, this might be a way to, <coughs> This might be a way to uh, help support uh, expanding our housing base by helping residents uh, do ADUs. And I also mentioned earlier trying to create a, um, a housing land trust may be a way we could help manage the, the time necessary to keep um, the rentals and all that sort of straight so that we're following our policy. But I really do support the fact that staff came up with this idea, and I think there's probably a lot of potential here. And as Jamie said, uh, we don't have older mechanisms. We're going to have to think of new mechanisms to solve a, a real problem, which is to provide affordable housing to people in this community so that, as I've said before, it's a balanced community. And I think overall, we'll be much happier when we have a balanced community and do all that it takes to create a balanced community. Thank you very much. So, Councilman Bertrand, are you um, agreeing with which which part of the staff re recommendation are you are you supporting, if if either? <laughs> well, to me, this is an overall thing, and it could go in many different directions. But I want to see alternatives, and like I just closed with, we have to figure out different ways to solve a very real problem to meet affordable housing and in general I support trying to create a balanced community and I feel that's a much healthier place for people to live in than raise your kids and to retire. So you would like to see those alternatives brought back at a future meeting or postponed until 2023? Oh no I thought I said that at the beginning. No, I, I think it should come back definitely. I don't want to wait for 2023 but what I was trying to suggest when I first started talking is we need some effort to make this to be a good presentation and a good um, choice of uh, policy discussion points for us. I, I wouldn't want it back in a week or two weeks, but you know, maybe like a four to six month. You know, this, this is going to take some time to develop something. Okay. Got it. All right, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, I'd like um, for staff to come back with information um, on additional alternatives sooner than later. So I'm in agreement with um, Councilmember Bertrand. Um, Katie, you specifically mentioned um, deed options for deed restrictions and developer fees. Um, I'm not sure how that correlates with our current ISO altogether, but if you could bring back some of those alternatives um, in the future at a future meeting. And also what I'd like to see is you've attached the um, white paper from MBAP in our um, in our packet today. And would it be great to see where the city stands in correlation to those recommendations. So as you bring back the other policies, it'd be nice to see um, how that relates and how well we're doing. Um, so then that, could, that may alter our decisions on percentages of in lieu fees and so forth. Um, and I do like Jacques' recommendation of looking into a land trust. If we do decide to add in lieu fees, it'd be neat to see what some of those options are um, and if there's space for that or, um, yeah, just some of those alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bachelor? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, with regard to policy six, I think that uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm leaning towards that we need to postpone this until 2023. I think staff, uh, uh, this project ISO in itself, and all the questions and the options that we've got in the previous five uh, policies is overwhelming staff. Considering especially that right now with COVID, uh, our, that department, uh, community development is down one person. So I am thinking that, we, that this is not essential. This one component does not make or break this policy, and that uh, I think the other ones are more definite. So I would uh, lean towards uh, 
post 20 years until the 2023 housing element. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bottor. Uh, Councilmember Story, do you have any uh, additional comments on this uh, policy item? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I kind of share the sentiments of uh, Councilman Fortas. I mean, yeah, this, this is um, many significant issues, and um, it may be better to put it off until uh, the housing element renewal. Um, with that said, uh, I am interested in uh, um, having an update at the next meeting about how we're doing with our um, ADU uh, permitting. Um, and uh, our and the our density bonus law that we um, well the state law and that uh, we implemented uh, some years back, and then the affordable housing overlay. Um, I'd like to get a sense of how successful those policy initiatives have been, or not, um, and then you know maybe we could um, look at tweaking those uh, without too much staff effort at that point to, to try to make them maybe even more successful. So uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Council Member Story. Um, in regard to uh, my, my thoughts on this, is it possible essentially to do both? Can we have um, information brought back to us at a, at a future meeting and then also in 2023 revisit this again? Or is it one or the other? No, that's possible, but I, I, I do, we, when we included this item, I think we were trying to toss out some ideas that we'd seen in other jurisdictions that maybe there was some interest in the council in considering, like the uh, alter, the um, land dedication and some of these things. Um, if, if what we're talking about is looking at establishing, I think Council Member Bertrand called it a land trust, it sounds to me like it's sort of a separate government entity that maybe manages affordable housing. That's a really big question. And I mean, I think bifurcating that from the housing, the, sorry, the inclusionary update would probably be wise. So, so I just don't think that we're gonna be able to address all of these different questions that have come up in the context of the IHO, unless, unless we really wanna say, hey, the IHO is gonna be six months out. So I think my recommendation is, let's identify maybe there's some cool policy things we want to focus on over the next year or two, three years, keep us to get into the next housing element, but try and keep it a little bit more narrow or understand that the IHO is going to be a bigger thing and it's going to, you know, we're just going to put it on a different timeline. And that's okay too if the council wants to go in that direction. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've got three council members with their hands up, so let's go ahead and, and uh, wrap up with our final comments on policy item six. We're right at the end here. Uh, we've been about an hour and a half on this item alone, so let's um, get our, our final thoughts in and then we'll, we'll move along. Uh, council member Bertrand. Um, yeah, following from Sam and then Jamie touching it a little bit more, I think in a lot of discussions, this is the perfect example. There are things that we could probably act on very easily, or if not easily, sooner than later. And um, so I support looking at, at the problem from that perspective. Um, the land trust could take a little bit of effort. It's not a separate government entity. It would be a nonprofit. But that would be perhaps a longer term thing. And as Sam said, well, maybe there's some programs that we have on board right now, and they need to be tweaked because they're not performing as we would wish they performed. So maybe that's something we could look at in a more closer time frame. Those are my comments. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks? You have final, final comments, Vice Mayor Brooks? Oh, sorry, I paused there. Um, I apologize for that. Um, so I just feel like we kind of got stuck into this policy like it was a trick question city manager, so if there are options that we kind of made reference to, if those could just be brought back, that would be my ask um, in relation to what you were talking about, Jamie, or um, those other things that would seem more feasible to include with the current um, update. So that's what I'd like to see. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Katie, do you 
feel like you have guidance on this or is it clear? Yeah, I, I think I'm hearing, uh, the conversation got very broad for a moment there of talking about including things that are outside of the IHO. So I just want to be clear that this question is really asking about alternatives to producing on-site housing and in movies. Um, some of the larger questions about a land trust, that really is not, um, that's something we can definitely come back to and have conversations for, about that separately in the future, but I really, I, I want to set the expectation that we're going to bring back alternatives to the on-site and in Lucy, and those alternatives would include um, items such as land dedication, so if, a, if, if someone was developing a project, they could opt to, do, to um, dedicate land to the city. Like I said, it probably won't be used that often because we have limited land. Um, offset affordable housing production and uh, possible acquisition and rehabilitation of the system units. So we can bring, I'm hearing that you would like us to bring forth options, but um, I just want to keep this uh, within the limits of what could be within an IHL. I understand there's also um, a desire to have an update on ADM permits. That is, uh, we can do that, but it is separate from the IHO, the ADUs, the, um, we just updated our ordinance on that, and yes, we have had um, movement on I, um, ADUs, and I can bring back discussion on that. The density bonus law also separate from the IHO update, um, but we can bring back information, but that won't impact the IHO update, to be clear. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Katie and, and all the staff that's, that's worked on this and uh, council members, everyone that provided public comment, thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there's no vote on this item. Council is just providing uh, guidance to staff. Uh, so we are going to move on along uh, to item 8E, um, adopt a resolution declaring an emergency condition pertaining to the CZ lightning complex fire. Okay, bear with me for a second here while I pull up the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. No worries. Okay, this should do it. Okay, we'll do this from here. So on August 16th, there was a very uncommon lightning storm that struck the county as well as all of Northern California, resulting in the multiple fires being started. Between the 16th and the 18th, a lot of those fires ended up merging back in the um, in the Redwood Forest between Santa Cruz and San Mateo counties. And then due to the fire spread um, on August 19th, Santa Cruz County declared it a local emergency. Oops. In August, between August 19th and the 21st, the communities of Bonnie and Boulder Creek, Ben Loma, Delton, Scotts Valley, and the UC uh, SC campus were all evacuated. On August 19th, um, the Santa Cruz County made a mutual aid request of other local jurisdictions in the county. And then on August 20th, um, as emergency services director, I declared a local emergency based on the regional conditions and the need for mutual aid. Uh, our emergency response and our support has been four officers, uh, each split between two two-hour shifts, two 12-hour shifts uh, daily. Uh, we initially were looking at opening the Jade Street Community Center as an evacuation shelter. However, with the COVID restrictions and the need for social distancing, we really determined that the number of um, people that could be accommodated there versus larger sites, it just didn't make sense to put the 
put the resources into staffing and setting up um, CHC community centers. So the county EOC decided they were going to focus on larger sites. As of today, we have 81,000 acres that are burned. Um, the fire is being reported as 21% contained. There's 635 structures so far reported destroyed. There's one death. Um, the good news is that I think many of you may have heard Scotts Valley has been allowed to repopulate as of about 3 o'clock this afternoon. So the recommendation this evening is for the council to adopt a resolution declaring an emergency condition um, uh, continues to exist and continue the uh, local emergency. And I guess the one point I didn't make is, is that the, the reason for the local emergency has to do with obviously the mutual aid we're providing and the conditions countywide, but also to ensure that we can be reimbursed for our part in the overall emergency response. Kim, with that, I'm available for questions. All right, council members, are there any questions for city manager Goldstein? I am seeing none. So with that, uh, we will open public comment on this item. Turn it over to Larry to let us know if there's any public comment. I do not see any hand raised, hand raised, excuse me, on there, um, and I do not see any emails on this item. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll close public comment, bring it back to council uh, for discussion and the vote. I'll move to staff recommendation. Motion by Council Member Story. Do we have a second? Council Member Bertrand, I think you're trying to speak, but you're muted. I can see your, your lips moving, but no sound. I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, 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 motion by Council Member Story, seconded by Council Member Bothor. Um. Okay. Let's, uh, can we get a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. I think our uh, city clerk might be muted. Cool. I'm not sure. I apologize, Council Member Bertrand. Give it a thumbs up. Okay, great. Council Member Bottorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, Madam Mayor. Madam yes. Mayor. It yes. appears that there's someone on the attendees that wanted to speak. There's a hand up. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I didn't see any hands up when I called for public comment. Um, it, was, it was late. But yeah. Here now. Okay. Okay, let's um, let's go ahead and reopen for this this one public comment, uh, and then we'll move to our, our final item. Hi, good evening, folks. This is Leah Samuels, Executive Director of Cummins Care Alliance. Thanks for being here so late. I just when we're thinking about um, emergency, declaring emergency and such, I just hope you'll keep in mind when we revisit your budget that once again, as we face an emergency, the nonprofits whose uh, grant funding was cut are on the front line helping your neighbors. This isn't a community service, it's direct essential safety and health services. We're asking that you consider when you look at the budget moving forward, moving from funding from non-essential programs and indirect spending to support these heroes Cal Fire has recognized how impressive our community response led by local nonprofits has been. Many of the nonprofits that you were assisting are those social justice leaders want to see getting priority like police for public safety. I know some of you protest and organize for social justice. This is a way to be a leader and make the change that you are trying to ask for. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we will reclose public comment and go on to our final item, um, 8F, delegation of a voting, excuse me, designation of a voting delegate and alternate for the 2020 League of California Cities Annual Conference. Is there a staff report on this or is it pretty straightforward? Sounds like what it is. 
It's pretty straightforward. We need to designate a delegate. The conference is October 7th through 9th. Normally, it requires a council member to go. This will be a virtual conference. The delegate is the person who can vote on behalf of the city on the different league initiatives and league policy positions. Okay, great. Do you have any questions? Okay. Is there any questions on this item? Let's go back to panelists. Seeing none. Oh, council member Bosworth. Question? Is there anyone of the council who's planning on attending this virtual conference? I'm planning on attending. That does it. All right. Let's bring it to public comment on this item. Turn it over to Larry. I do not see any hands raised. And let me check the email. And I do not see any emails on this item. All right. We'll bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. I am planning on attending virtually. I've attended in person before. I think I was our delegate last year. I can't even remember what year it is anymore because last year feels like last week and last week feels like last year. So we nominate the mayor. All right. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for the voting delegate. We also need an alternate. Anyone interested? Motion to nominate the vice mayor. Did I see Councilmember Bertrand? I withdraw my motion of Vice Mayor Brooks and would like to amend it if the second would amend it to Councilman Bertrand. Yes, that's fine. Okay. So we have a motion and a second for myself as the voting delegate and a motion and a second for Councilmember Bertrand as the alternate for the 2020 League of California Cities Annual Conference. Do we need a vote on both of those motions? You can do it together. Okay. Let's do a vote on those two motions, please. Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand? Sorry. He's giving a thumbs up again. I think he's got some audio issues. That's wonderful. Councilmember Bottorf? Aye. Councilmember Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Those are carried unanimously. Councilmember Bottorf, you have your hand up. Do you have a comment? I've had my hand up all night by mistake. I've been a nuisance and I apologize, okay? I'm just making sure you want to have like the last word on this or something. You have the last word. Okay. All right. With that, we have come to the end of tonight's agenda. Thank you so much to staff for all of your hard work on all of the staff reports and recommendations for this evening. Thank you for all of you who have joined us for the last several hours to provide public comment. As always, and especially now more than ever, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other, and we'll see you next time. Meeting is adjourned. Have a good night. Thank you all.